night. Uh, on this hot, I started to say summer evening, but it's not summer yet. It feels like it. But everybody get a hymn book, turn to page 583. We'll sing in the garden. 583. And I'm going to let you stay seated, and I'm going to sit down, and we're going to sing. This bad knee here. us another here in just a minute good to see each and every one of you here tonight uh, we do want to go uh, to the Lord uh, in prayer and does anybody have a uh, spoken prayer request tonight before we pray yes all right yes Yes. Yeah, Nancy's brother passed, so do remember her. I believe Sister Kathy. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. I know he enjoyed that. Yes. Anybody else? 
Amen. Yes, yes. Any others? Yes, remember Sister Jewel. Uh, lift her up to the Lord and also Brother Vernon. Any others? Yes, remember Brother Kenneth. Pray for a service tonight. We're going to be in chapter 13 of Revelation. So the person we're, uh, well, we'll be looking really at the two beasts. I believe they're two persons. But, you know, the Antichrist could be alive today. We don't know. It's very possible. If he is, we know what that means. If, he, if he's an adult, that means uh, going home time is getting pretty close. So he could very well be, he very well could be alive. We don't know. You know it? But, that, but I know Jesus is alive, and that's all that matters. Amen? And I'm alive in him. Amen? And the church is not going down. The church is going up. Amen? We're going to be with the Lord. So we look forward to that. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank the Lord. He's a prior answering God, ain't he? Yes. He takes care of us. And good to have Brother Richard Berger back with us. Amen. Church Lady Moore. Richard's up in the balcony there. Brother, we love you. And it, it's just so good to have you back with us. I tell you what. Amen. We appreciate Brother Richard. Yes. Amen. Any, any other prayer requests? Okay. Okay, Jessica. Let's pray for Jessica. Any others? I see Harley must be feeling a little better, so praise the Lord for that. All right. How about the unspoken requests? There are many. Tell you what we're going to do. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to go ahead and receive... The Lord's tithes and offering, and we'll uh, ask our ushers to come. I think we about two can do it. <coughs> Brother Wayne Scott, would you ask the blessing over the offering, please, and pray for us. Yes.
praise God, I belong. Amen. I'm so glad. Brother Jason, and let's let's get into the Word of God tonight. Revelation chapter thirteen. Revelation chapter number thirteen. We are making our way uh, swiftly through through this this book, and uh, well, actually, we're uh, more than halfway through. We're right at the central point but uh it's a great great chapter and i'm just going to go ahead and read all 18 verses and then we're going to we're going to look at this chapter to, together and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy this had to be one ugly huge gross looking creature you know it coming out of coming out of the sea and notice how he describes it verse 2 and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Now we know who the dragon is. We studied about the dragon in Revelation chapter 12 the dragon is that old serpent the devil more than anything Satan wants worship but this is the problem he wants what only is reserved and belongs to the Lord himself he wanted it so much that when Jesus was in the wilderness we know being tempted of the devil he came against Jesus and said, he showed, took him up to a high place and showed him the cities and everything around. And he said, I'll give you all of this if you'll just fall down and worship me. He wants what doesn't belong to him. Worship belongs unto the Lord. He is the one that we are to worship. All right. So we read there in verse number four, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months 40 and two months how, how, how long a time is that is that three and a half years yeah three and a half years all right but notice it's three and a half years he's limited in what in the time that he has to rule verse number six and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against god to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven and it was given unto him to make war with the saints pay close attention there it says the saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations 
and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. My goodness. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Listen, listen up. That's what he's saying. Pay, pay attention to what you're reading here. Get it. All right? He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast. Make note of that. Another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Let me just stop here and say before I read any further, the devil has power. Demons have power. But only God has all power and authority. Satan can only do what God permits him to do. This is going to be an awful time on the earth that we're reading about here. There, now, there are things in the Bible, they are mysteries. You and I, uh, through our human reasoning, we may have some questions and we may wonder why this and why that, but let me just say this. God has a purpose for everything that he does and everything that he allows to take place. But that does not mean that God has withdrawn himself and that God is no longer in control of what's going on. Amen? So we need to keep that in, in, in mind. All right. So we see that in verse 15, chapter 13, Revelation, this second beast is called by the false prophet also. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Wow. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Anyone that's familiar with the languages know that the Hebrew and, and also the, the Koine Greek or the Greek, we know that even the very letters of these languages have numeric value, okay? We know that. And I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself a, a numerical expert on this, especially in Bible prophecy. But I do know, and I've studied enough to know that each letter, individual letter within the Hebrew alphabet and also the Greek alphabet have a numerical value, okay? And that's what Brother John is, is saying here, he's saying that, that, notice it says, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a what? Right here, I believe he's saying that this, this Antichrist, yeah, he's going to be 
uh, possessed by Satan. He's going to have the power of the devil himself. Uh, but he, I believe he's a man. I, I believe this, uh, this lets us know that. It's a number of a man, and his number's what? 600, three score, that's 60, and 6, which is 6, 6, 6. Now let me say the perfect number is 7. Seven, 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 that's perfect. See, six is the number of man. Man comes short. Everything that Satan does comes short. Everything that he promises, he don't deliver. But everything that God promises, he does deliver. So thank God we serve a God that always keeps his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word that we've just read. And we ask now, Lord, that you will anoint us with the Holy Spirit. And God, just help me, Lord, to rightly divide thy word of truth. I realize, Lord, that there are many things uh, in Bible prophecy that's, that's hard for our little minds to completely grasp and understand. But we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word. And we know there's a purpose behind it. And Lord, you want your people to be informed and to, and to know about the times that we're living in. Now, Father, just help us to exalt your name. Lord, to expose the enemy. Lord, that no one would be deceived by him. We know he's a master deceiver. So God, have your will and way. And Lord, help me remember all that that we've studied. And Lord, may we just be a blessing to your people tonight. And may we all be able to leave your house saying it was good to be here. May Jesus be exalted. If there's anybody here don't know you, Lord, may they be saved. In his name we pray. And all the Lord's people said, We know the scene right before we get into chapter 13. When we get into chapter 13, things are again transferred to earth. The devil recognizes in chapter 12 that his defeat is final he is powerless against the son of god but for a time he knows and that's a short time he can persecute the woman however she escapes into the wilderness where she's nourished during a period of great persecution the devil attempts to prevent her escape by casting out of his mouth a flood of water but the scripture tells us that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the river. The woman, however, is preserved. The most satanic attack can never destroy the church. But individual Christians can be made victims of Satan's hatred and his spite. Thus, the dragon waxed wroth with the woman and went away to make war the scripture tells us with the rest of her seed that keep the commandments of god and hold the testimony of jesus yes my friends the power of evil undoubtedly is symbolized and embodied in satan yet he must have as his agents men and human institutions Thus, in this central scene of the apocalypse, he employs two terrifying figures which are designated as beasts. One comes up out of the sea. The other comes up out of the earth. Now, what is meant by these beasts? To what do they correspond? Probably to John in his day, they pictured the imperial power of Rome and the cult of emperor worship which were united to try to crush the infant church they find their counterparts whenever a despotic uh, civil power is combined with some form of false religion but the picture will never be completely fulfilled until it is embodied in certain persons or movements of the last days 
You remember when the Soviet Union fell and everybody thought, oh, we're done with Russia. I knew we weren't done with Russia because I've read what Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 says. It talks about Tubal and, and, and Meshach and Gog and Magog. Listen, we haven't heard the last from Russia in Bible prophecy. And I want to remind everybody that Vladimir Putin was with the, the KGB and he was uh, appointed by Yeltsin. Yes, he, he won some elections, but he is a ruthless dictator. Along the lines, he can be compared with Hitler. He's a very dangerous man. But you know what? He's doing the same thing that Hitler's doing. He's using his propaganda and he's, he's, he's convinced his people that he's fighting the Nazis. Yeah. We haven't heard the lies from Russia. But let me say, you know, there's some wonderful Christian people that live in Russia. There's innocent people. They, they don't approve of what's going on, but you know what? If they stand against it, they'll either have them shot or lock them up. You know it could get that way here in America? We still protest, but it all, a lot of times it depends on which side you're protesting against or who, what side you're on. Is, or, no, it really depends on who's sitting in the Oval Office in the White House and the administration. I'm not going to get political on you tonight, but we're in a heap of mess. Everything seems to be pointing to what our Lord's soon return. So we need to be about our Father's business. But this picture will never be completely fulfilled until it is embodied in certain persons or movements of the last days. These are identified with the son of perdition or the man of sin. Or he's also called the, the Antichrist. Their advent seemed very near to John. Their career was to be brief. And their destruction was to be accomplished by the returning Christ. John borrows his figures from the visions of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel depicts under the form of four beasts a series of world empires which have to do with the fate of his own people. John combines into one the various features of the four. Notice this beast, how he describes the beast. It arises out of the sea, which latter may be a symbol of the disturbed and stormy social and political conditions out of which tyrannies commonly arise. Notice he has ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns ten diadems, and upon his heads names of blasphemy, which depict pagan power worldwide and complete the beast combines the feline cruelty and dexterity of a leopard with the massive strength of a bear and the terrifying roar of a lion the last may picture some sudden edict of persecution against the church notice his power and his throne and great authority are given him by the dragon. Now, people do not know. We don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I can make a bunch of predictions. And if I did, you'd say I was crazy. You can make some predictions. But my friend, everything that, that's been prophesied for, that's to take place in the future, it will happen. Whether I, I believe it or whether, whether you believe it, whether we understand or not, it's going to happen. I like, God's the only one that knows the future. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. I love these two verses. Here, here's the Lord speaking. He says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying listen saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my 
pleasure. So man has tried to predict the future, but he has failed. In the 1870s, Milton Wright, a bishop of the Church of the United Brethren in Christ, was outraged by a college president's suggestion that, quote, within 50 years, men will learn to fly through the air like birds. The bishop was shocked by those words, and he responded by saying these words, flying is reserved for the angels. I beg you not to mention that again, lest you be guilty of blasphemy. Well, 33 years after the bishop made that statement, his two sons, Wilbur and Orville, launched their powered aircraft at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Hey, it happened, didn't it? So let's look, let's look at these, these two characters that's in chapter 13. Number one, the beast out of, out of the sea. We see this in the first ten verses. In the chaotic times of confusion, boy, we're living there now, ain't we? Uncertainty and unrest that will prevail during the tribulation, the world will long for a leader. People will be desperately, boy, it seems like we're, we're there, don't it? People will be desperately hoping for someone powerful and influential to unite the divided and contentious nations of the world. Someone to bring hope in the midst of helplessness. Someone to provide a sense of security in an unsettled time of apprehension and fear. Boy, we're there, aren't we? People will be desperately seeking a strong, charismatic, authoritative leader, my goodness, to pull the world back from the brink of disaster. Wow. Sounds like time we're living in, don't it? Those longings will be fulfilled. The powerful leader people desire will come and unify the world under his rule. He will appear at first to be everything people thought they were looking for. And for a brief time, he will bring peace and prosperity. But he will turn out to be far more than the world bargained for. For he will be a dictator more cruel and powerful than any other leader the world has ever known. This man, often called the Antichrist, will be the culmination of a long line of would be conquerors. What men like Alexander the Great and the Roman emperors in ancient times and Hitler and Stalin in modern times only dreamed of doing, the Antichrist actually will do. He will rule the entire world and receive its worship. Now just for a little while, I want to share some, some things about, about the Antichrist, about this first beast. First of all, notice his ancestry. We see that in, in verse number 1 of chapter 13. He is the son of the devil. He is the Antichrist. Now, let me go ahead and say this. The devil is a counterfeiter. He's an imitator. We believe in the Holy Trinity, right? We believe this uh, one God is manifested in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Well, you know there's a false trinity. It's called the Satanic Trinity. A and Satan himself wants to be God the Father. Then we go to the second person of this false trinity, and that's the Antichrist that we're looking at. He's the false Christ. And then who's the third person of the Holy Trinity? The precious Holy Spirit. And this second beast, which is also uh, known uh, as the false prophet, he will be a false Holy Spirit. 
See, here's the thing about Satan. The Bible says that he appears as an angel of light. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. He is a murderer. He is a thief. And isn't it something that most of the people in the world that will be alive at this time that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they are going to pay homage and they are going to worship the devil and this anti-Christ. My goodness. Notice we see some similarities in this first beast and, and the dragon. We look over in chapter 12. Go over in chapter 12 and you'll see this dragon that John saw. He, he describes him. Notice he describes him in verse number 3. He said of chapter 12 of Revelation, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. How many heads did he have? Having seven heads, how many horns? And ten horns, and how many crowns upon his heads? He had seven on his head, seven crowns. Now go to chapter 13, and we read about this beast that arises out of the sea. How many heads does he have? Seven. How many horns? Ten. And upon his horns, what's he have? Ten crowns, and, on his head, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. So we see some similarity here. And notice the name of blasphemy. And this beast, we know is compared to a leopard. Uh, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a dragon and a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And the dragon gave him his power. Now what did God the Father give to God the Son? He gave him his power, didn't he? Jesus operated under the authority of his heavenly Father. Every Thing Jesus did, every, every act Jesus did, everything that came forth from his mouth was to please his Father. He was in complete submission to his Heavenly Father. And you know, when the Holy Spirit was sent, after Jesus ascended back into heaven and he was glorified, and we know on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sit down uh, upon the church. We know that the Holy Spirit honors and glorifies Jesus Christ. He's the one that empowers the church to win lost souls to Christ. Amen? So the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, will not speak of himself. He said, he'll guide you. He'll make known all truth unto you. He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, he said, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, he said, I'll send you another comforter. And thank God we know that comforter is the precious Holy Spirit. How many thankful for the Holy Spirit? Amen. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we see his ancestry, but notice his authority. His authority is given to him by Satan. Ultimately, God has to allow this, right, and permit it because God is sovereign. God is sitting on his throne. But someday, hey, all of this is going to take place and will be in eternity. But we're not there yet. And God has his reasons for what, as we said, he does allow. We know that the leopard, the bear, and the lion were well known in Palestine. They dramatically emphasized the characteristics of the nations they represent. The lion was a fitting symbol for the fierce, consuming power of the Babylonian Empire. The ferocity, the strength, and the stability of the Medo-Persian Empire led to its depiction as a bear. The Greeks' swift conquest, particularly under Alexander the Great, reflect the speed and the viciousness of the leopard. John lists the three animals in reverse order from Daniel since he was looking backward in time. Daniel, looking forward in time, listed the animals and the kingdoms they represent in chronological order. So we've seen this Antichrist, his ancestry, his authority, but notice in verse 3, his acclaim. Verse number 3. Look at verse 3. He said, And I saw 
One of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. This leads us to believe that this great leader, this Antichrist, is either going to die or they're going to fake that he died. Remember, the devil's a great faker, right? There's differences of opinion here by, by scholars and by commentators and by Bible prophecy students, but he's going to receive a wound. And that wound, does it tell us where that wound's going to be? It does, don't it? A wound to where? A wound to his head. You know, there's a reason why that, uh, that Roman soldier, and, and Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. What's that helmet called? It's called a helmet of salvation, isn't it? Listen, if you, if you don't have your mind right with God, I know we've got to have our heart right with God, but you know, your mind matters to God. I'm going to tell you who else it matters to. Your mind matters to the devil too. He, he wants to try to confuse our minds. No, thank God he can't if we have the mind of Christ. Amen? And I read somewhere that we use very little potential that we have in our brain. God help us. God help me. Amen? God has so, uh, made us so amazingly. Amen? So, but notice that he's going to receive a wound and some would say that, this, that he was wounded to death or slain. His, but something happened. His deadly wound was healed. All right? And all the world wandered after the beast. Remember, I told you the devil is an imitator, right? Jesus Christ was brutally slain, wasn't he, on the cross. Jesus Christ didn't deserve anything that he got, did he? You and I are the ones that deserved it. But Jesus had to pay that price for us in order for us to be redeemed and our sins to be taken care of through his precious blood that he shed for us on that cross. So this, this leader is going to uh, supposedly come back from the dead and, and the world is just going to be caught up with this that's happened. So we see his acclaim and that's we see his adoration. They're going to worship this anti-Christ. My goodness. That's what verse 4 says. And also worship the dragon. Let me make a point here. I believe Paul talks about this. And you remember the, the church in his time, I believe in the church at Corinth, and maybe also the church at Rome when he wrote his letter to the Romans, the Christians there. They talked about these sacrifices that were offered unto idols. And you know what Paul's conclusion of that is? When they were sacrificing these, uh, these animals and they were offering them up to these false gods, hey, these false gods we, don't, we know didn't exist, they were actually offering them up to the devil. Any worship that doesn't go toward the Lord, it goes toward the devil. I mean, isn't that, isn't that right? If we truly are worshiping the Lord, how do we worship Him? In spirit. And in what? And in truth. So we know the enemy craves more than anything worship to himself. But only God, only our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I can put the Holy Spirit in there because He's God, only the Holy Trinity is worthy of our worship. This one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen? All right. So we see his adoration. But notice in verses 5 and 6, we see his arrogance. My goodness, his arrogance. Mm. In verse 5 and 6, he had a filthy mouth, a blasphemous mouth. He spoke great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. My goodness. I tell you what, I, I don't like to hear people take the name of my Lord in vain. Do you? But I learned one. God taught me a lesson one time. Kathy and I had went down to, I believe, to Atlanta to see my brother, see her brother Steve down in Georgia. And I've never heard the filthiest talking woman in my life. And I was pumping gas. And she has taken the Lord's name in vain. And before I thought, I just looked over and said, Ma'am, I don't appreciate you taking my Lord's name in vain the way you are. Oh, my goodness. Then she lit into me. 
And you know what the Lord taught me? That, that taught me a lesson. Cast not that which is holy under the dogs. I'm not saying that woman was a dog, okay? But God taught me something. Hey, I, 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 I still don't like to hear people take the name of the Lord in vain. Amen? Now, if you're going to worship Him and speak to Him in prayer, amen, go at it. But don't take His name in vain. But this Antichrist is so vile, so profane, so wicked that these words are going to issue forth from his mouth. Not only against God himself and his name, but against his house, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. You know the devil hates anything that has to do with Jesus. He hates you tonight. He hates me tonight. Why, well, if he could have convinced us not to have church while well, his life said, boy, I fooled, I fooled them there at Milligan. I convinced them they don't need to have church tonight. We don't need to listen to Satan. We need to listen to Jesus. Amen? But, but we see here that he's going to be arrogant, an arrogant person. But then verse 7 tells us his activity. Notice his activity in verse, in verse number 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power. My, my, my. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. My, 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 my. But notice the way this is phrased here, that God is allowing this. And God has his reasons, all right? Does everybody see that? He wouldn't have been able to get this power if God hadn't have permitted it. Is that, is that clear to everybody? God is allowing this to happen. But thank God, God is only giving him a, a little bit of time. It seems like the older I get, months seem to be like a week, and, and years seem to be like months. Anybody experiencing that? Now, you that are a little bit younger than us, you probably think, boy, I wish time had passed by quicker. You wait till you get, get up our age, it'll really pass quickly. Am I telling the truth? I mean, you blink your eye and you're through a week. But thank the Lord, it's only going to be for a set time, it's only going to be for 42 months. So we see his activity. Then notice his admirers in verses 8 to 10. I mean, the world is going to go crazy over, over this person. Isn't this, it's, it, isn't this something? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. They're going to get caught up with this person whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Do you know what? If, if a leader were to arise to prominence today and could take care of a lot of things that is going on in this world, there'd be a bunch of people follow after that leader. But my friend, we better be careful who we follow. We better make sure that we're following the Lord first and foremost and not be deceived by this wicked world. And notice what we read in verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. None of us know what we're going to be called or what we will have to go through in our Christian lives. So he has admirers. Now let's look at the false prophet. See where we're at here. All right, I think we got a little bit of time here. I'm going to try to get through, through the false prophet. If we, if we don't, we will... Uh, We'll get back with it uh, next week. Now, I like what Bruce said about this false prophet. He called him the Antichrist minister of propaganda. Yeah, minister of propaganda. We see this second beast, he comes up out of the earth, not out of the sea. He's described as differing in his character. In him... The priesthood of the cult of emperor worship may be symbolized. His spear is not political, but it's religious. By deception and cruelty, he attempts to destroy the church 
and to substitute for Christianity the universal worship of the beast. Now, I want us to see three things about him. First of all, we see his person in verse number 11. In contrast to the first beast who will come up out of the sea, we know he'll come up out of the earth. Like the Antichrist, the false prophet will be indwelt by a demon out of the abyss, which is pictured here as the flaming depths of the earth. Now in the ancient world, the earth was less mysterious and foreboding than the sea. That the false prophet arises from the earth suggests that he will be subtler, gentler, less overpowering and terrifying than the Antichrist. He will be winsome and persuasive. The epitome of the wolves and sheep's clothing that Jesus warned us of in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 15. This false prophet, he seems as harmless as a lamb. He does not come as a conquering dictator, but on the surface appears as a subtle deceiver with meekness and gentleness, though not without great authority. But despite his deceptively mild appearance, the false prophet is no less a child of hell than the Antichrist. He may appear on the outside to be as gentle as the lamb, but when he opens his mouth, remember what our Lord said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. When he speaks, he speaks with the mouth of the dragon. In other words, the devil is possessing this false prophet. When he speaks, he will show whom he really is. Does everybody see that? Yes. He is going to have a vile mouth. This is evident because he spoke as a dragon. A strange voice indeed for a lamb. The false prophet like the Antichrist will be the the dragon Satan's mouthpiece, speaking his words. But he will not echo the, bl the blasphemous tirades against God that will pour from the lips of the Antichrist. We read about that in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Let me just say sometime, I don't know exactly when we're going to do this on, on Wednesday night. I may do it on Sunday night after we finish Revelation, or maybe Wednesday. We're going to uh, do a study in the book of Daniel. I'd really like us to go through the book of Daniel, preach and teach through that book because uh, really it helps you understand the book of Revelation to understand the book of, of Daniel as well. How many knows that? It really does because they deal with some of the very uh, same uh, things and subjects, all right? So we see here that he's going to be speaking deceptive words and he's going to deceive people. He's going to want to bring, he's going to speak words of praise about the Antichrist. And here's what he's going to attempt to do. He's going to try to lure the world to worship that vile, satanic dictator. That's what he's going to want to do. We see his person, but notice in verses 12 to 14, his power. Yes, he's going to have power. Even to be able to uh, call fire down from heaven. Now there was a prophet that did that, wasn't there? His name was Elijah, right? Remember that a great battle that was fought on, on, the, on top of Mount Carmel? We know the God that answered by fire was Jehovah God, was the God of Israel that Elijah called upon God. And remember now, we're, we've told you that the devil is an imitator. But when people see these miracles that's going to take place and these wonders that, that this false prophet is going to be able to do they are they're just going to be caught up with it you know people in this world today get caught up with excitement and and technology and all the things that's taking place friend don't get caught up in that stuff amen now i believe technology can be used for good if there was one good thing that came out out of the pandemic it was we had a live stream ministry that was started amen 
And I have, I have ha heard from people since we've got it started, people that could not go to church, how that it was a blessing to them. They weren't able to get up and, and, and come to church literally, but we brought church to them, and it's a good thing. Not a substitute for, for assembling ourselves together. We ought to come to church if we can. But if you can't come, boy, it, it, it's something good to have, isn't it? We can take church to those that cannot come to church. Amen? But we see here that this false prophet will have power. Power to deceive people. And this power is none other than Satan's power himself. So we see his power. And also then finally notice with me his program. Yeah, he's going to have a program. We see that in verses 15 to 18. He's going to, to try to make everybody worship this image that somehow life has come back to. And, and he's going to have to some, a measure pass that nobody can buy or sell unless they have a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Unless they have that. They, they cannot do any business. My goodness. Let me just say, if you're around when this takes place, my friend, do not take that mark. If you take that mark of the beast, you are headed for an eternal lake of fire where you'll burn forever where Satan himself and this Antichrist and the false prophet and all those that did not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ you will go to that awful place don't take that mark if, if you're listening say amen. amen so we see here he he uh, had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. My goodness. Can you not see that we're getting pretty close to this? We could get in the technology thing of this matter. And uh, I mean, let me, I want to recommend a book to you before we come to a close. I've got it on Kindle. Uh, Brother Robert Morgan. Anybody here know Brother Robert Morgan? Robert Morgan, he's, he's one of our friends. He's actually from this area. And I want to recommend a really good book to you. Uh, you can get this on Kindle. Let me go back and get this. I want to make sure I get the title right. The title of this book by, by Brother Robert Morgan is, and it's on Revelation, The 50 Final Events in world history I'll repeat that this is by Robert J Morgan you can buy this uh, like I said you can get it in Kindle uh, that's what I have it in the 50 final events in world history and what brother Rob does here in this book I haven't completely read it I just got it a few days ago but boy it's been very helpful he deals with some of these things in a much better way than I can myself but uh, I highly recommend uh, that that book by brother Robert uh, Morgan and that let me make sure I got that let me give you that title again the 50 final events in world history and what he does he goes through these in 50 final events he goes through the, the book of Revelation so I highly recommend you uh, to get uh, that book okay let's all stand to our feet our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed We never know who might be in church that needs Jesus. I know this subject is a daunting subject. And I confess to you, I don't totally understand it all myself. But I do have enough sense to realize that this is going to be the worst time that this planet earth is going to ever experience and that most people this is what's the tragedy 
Most people that will be alive during that time are going to worship this Antichrist and Satan. My friend, I don't want you to be among that number. We want you to come to Christ and be saved. You say, well, preacher, we're all saved here tonight. Well, you know what? I know I'm saved. I hope everybody here is saved tonight. But if you're not, we want to give you an opportunity to come to Christ and to be saved. Would there be someone would just slip up your hand right now and say, you know, I'm not right with God. I'm, I'm not saved. Would you pray for me? Anybody at all while we wait just a moment? I'm not a Christian. Will you pray for me? Anybody? Are you here tonight? You know somebody that really needs Jesus. Boy, you're so burdened for them. Would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, help me pray for them right now. God bless you. God bless you all over the church. All over the church. Will you help me pray for them? I tell you what let's do tonight would you just come I, I can't bow now because of this bad knee I've got but would, would you just step out from where you are and let's just spend let's spend a few moments and let's pray for these people that need Jesus would you just step out from where you are you can pray there at the pew where you're at or come up here at the altar and let's pour our hearts out for these folk that need Jesus and everyone else may be seated we want to spend time right now praying for these precious souls. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for us on the cross. Lord, our hearts are heavy. We are burdened because, Lord, we realize the awful times in which we live. Lord, as awful as they are, we know there's coming a time that's going to be even worse than the times in which we are living right now. And Lord, precious souls here are on the altar praying for loved ones and friends and co-workers and neighbors that they know, Lord, that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, we're agreeing together with them. We're asking that the precious Holy Spirit will bring conviction to these precious souls. Lord, as their names are being called out right now, we agree with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ask you, God, to go where they are right now and to bring conviction to their hearts. Precious Holy Spirit, convict them of their sins and draw them, Lord, to yourself. Help us, O oh God, to realize, Lord, that we're only passing through this life once. Lord, that we'll do your will. Lord, that we'll be a better witness for you. There's so many that need you, Jesus. Lord, we ask right now that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be that witness that you would have us to be. We love you, and we praise you tonight. Lord, have your will and way in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus, have your way. Yes, Lord. Oh, God, have your way. Amen. Let's sing a verse of that song, Brother Jason. Thompson, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?
Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. 